What happens when one man tries to watch all the horror films of the 1980s? Well, we're about to find out because I'm your host, Josh Spiegel, and this is The 80s Project, 1981. Okay, 1981 is in full swing now. And, and we're in the full swing of that post-Friday the 13th slasher boom. And you're going to see that in effect here. But, but this block is going to prove that, you, you know what? It wasn't all masked killers in the summer camps, as this may be one of the most eclectic blocks yet. Hey guys, before we start this week's video, I want to take one minute to talk to you about my new sponsor, Ridge, because they are redefining the wallet just in time for Father's Day. And hey, look, I got to tell you, I, I get a lot of requests for sponsors and I turned most of them down. I, I made a rule a little while back that I was really only going to cover products that I actually really enjoy. And I happen to love this quite a bit. Um, it has a great streamlined look for your wallet. I don't carry a ton of cards, but this is pretty handy. And look, look, look how slim that is. And if I want to carry more cards, it's expandable. You just slide them right inside there and it accommodates it. Holds up to 12 cards super easily. Plus, if I'm carrying cash, which I don't really carry cash, but if I am carrying cash, it goes right in this little money clip section right on the back. Super easy to carry, and it's RFID protected, so it'll keep you safe out there in this dangerous world that we live in. But also, if you want, you can get the matching key case, which I got right here in the matching color combo. And if you order the two of them together, you can get up to 30% off of your order. It's a pretty sweet deal. And with Father's Day coming up, this is a fantastic gift to give dad, to let him know that you, you think he, his style needs a little bit of revamping, because every dad wants to hear from their kids that their style needs revamping. And you can be confident because Ridge has over 3 million customers, 50,000 plus five star reviews, and you can test it out for 99 days to make sure that you're completely satisfied. And if you're not, you get a full refund. Comes with a lifetime warranty as well too. So you, you can't go wrong. And it's the perfect time to try it out as well too, because you can go to ridge.com slash timelines and place an order and get up to 40% off of your order. That's right, at ridge.com slash timelines, all the way up until June 15th, you can get up to 40% off of your order. Buy one for dad, buy one for you, buy one for just a buddy of yours, buy one for me, send, send me one, I don't, I don't care, It'd be pretty awesome, I'd, I'd take another one, absolutely. And that's ridge.com slash timelines, get yours today. This one starts in the best way possible because on May 8th, we got the release of the classic, The Burning. It kicks off at a summer camp with a prank gone wrong as a bunch of kids accidentally set fire to the caretaker there, a guy named Cropsy. It then jumps five years ahead and after a number of failed skin grafts, Cropsy is released and he starts killing. At another camp, the new season is about to begin and the campers include a young George. Little Ratner, and this guy right here, who you will notice is not Indian at all. So it would probably be really dumb and embarrassing to cast him as, a, as like an Indian man or something and, and ask him to do a horrible fake Indian accent, right? Plus, if you squint hard enough at just the right times in this movie, you'll spot a little baby Ed, which is short for Edwina. Now turn to the right. Now, the backstory here is pretty dense because although the plot is ridiculously similar to Friday the 13th and part two, even down to the killer's legend being told around a campfire culminating in a fake scare prank, the script was in development before that one was even released. The concept was actually developed by convicted serial sex pest Harvey Weinstein. It was his very first production and the treatment was written in 1979. But it's pretty clear that the reason the film ended up getting made was because of its summer camp similarities and the success of Friday. So it's not a case of, hey, that was popular, so I'm writing this script to cash in on that, as much as it was investors saying, hey, that was profitable, and this existing script is close to that, so let's back it. The director was actually Tony Malum, who had previously done mainly music documentaries and wouldn't do that many feature films afterwards, with one of his only other genre flicks being the Rutger Hauer sci-fi jam Split Second. 
This one is kind of notorious because Tom Savini did the effects on the film and turned down Friday the 13th Part 2 in order to do so, mainly because he didn't understand how there could be a sequel with Jason involved, and those effects are pretty awesome. Like, besides the standout canoe scene, which is the sequence that the film is mostly known for, the overall look of Cropsey himself is pretty great. Uh, if you're watching the credits, you'll also spot the name of Jack Shoulder as the editor. And, and we'll be hearing quite a bit more of him in the coming years, since he'd very soon after go on to direct Alone in the Dark, and then of course, Freddy's Revenge. The Burning wasn't very successful on release though, not even making back its $1.5 million budget in the US box office. Thankfully, international business did a bit better, it ended up being profitable, but it was pretty far from a hit. My rating on this one is a four. I really dig this one, but it all does feel a bit familiar. And sure, of course it does nothing new, but it, but it's all done so well that I don't mind. It's horror cultural significance is a 3.5 and I almost gave it a four, but it's not quite there. It's notable for the Savini effects and the group of young faces that would go on to bigger things, but considering that it flopped on its release and has never established any sort of lasting legacy in terms of follow-ups and only really gained its reputation through a cult following in later years, I can't really give it any higher. Should you watch it? Absolutely, you will not regret it. <laughs> so uh, you girls all set for the trip tomorrow? Nothing I can get you? Life jacket? Spermicide? Oh! Hey, you gotta be prepared. You know. Now we're gonna head all the way to France because on May 13th, we got the release of Zombie Lake, which wasn't released in the US until 1985. And it begins with a woman swimming nude in a lake, but there's a zombie under there. There's, there's a zombie in the lake, in the movie called Zombie Lake. Although it's clearly a swimming pool considering you can see a sign up here. The mayor is concerned about the missing girl and seems to know more than he lets on. And the zombie comes out to attack and he's a Nazi. And he bites this girl's neck, although maybe he, he doesn't because when he lifts his mouth, it's very clear that her skin is completely unbroken. And there's a lot to talk about here with this one. Uh, so the original director was meant to be Jess Franco, who has already been on the project three freaking times. And he wrote most of the script here, but he quit just before they were about to begin filming. It seems he got into too many arguments with the distributors regarding the budget, so they needed someone to take his place. They tapped Jean Roland, who has also been on the project already with The Night of the Hunted, and he came on board just a day or two before filming began, and only did it as a favor to the producer. He hated the script though, and even let a protege direct some of the scenes that he didn't want to, and the direction was instead credited to the fictional J.A. Laser. Roland hated it so much that afterwards he removed it from his filmography, and if you asked him if he was involved with it, he denied it. The story's weird because after the whole setup part, it goes into this really lengthy flashback to World War II to give the backstory, and it ends up feeling like you're watching a whole different movie. Like this started with a zombie attacking a nude gal in a lake, and now we're getting dramatic war sequences. But then it bounces back to the present to a group of skinny dippers. Upon release, it actually did fairly well, but quickly gained notoriety for being one of the worst zombie movies ever made. And it's not hard to see why, when your zombies are just people who are painted green. But the coloring is inconsistent, so you can see regular skin tone showing through on the spots where it's rubbing off. Oh, let's go! Yeah! 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 Well, go get him. You're damn right! Let's get rid of them once and for all. Count on me. And I'm giving this one a one. It's as dull as can be. You're just sitting there staring at it and waiting for it to be done. But it just keeps going. Its significance is a little higher at a one and a half, mainly for the presence of Roland and the almost presence of Franco. Should you watch it? Only if you need help sleeping. She's dead. She's been murdered. They found her on the road. Maria's dead. Maria. 
Just two days later, on May 15th, back in the US, the boom of the slasher phenomenon continued with Happy Birthday to Me. It begins with Bernadette here, played by Leslie Donaldson, who we saw not that long ago in Funeral Home, but she doesn't last as long here and is killed by an unseen stalker. And then Mary Ingalls is here, and we just saw her in Midnight Offerings, and she's still having some trouble dealing with the loss of her mother, and someone seems to be following her around. Seems Ginny had some medical issues in the past, and her doc is paw-freaking-Kent, and the killer continues his spree in some creative ways. And the red herrings start coming. And this is another one that just gets lumped in with being credited to appearing in Friday the 13th's Wake. But like The Burning, this one was in development before that. In fact, judging from the setting and atmosphere, it seems to be more influenced by Halloween than anything else. And this director was a bit of a big deal. It's J. Lee Thompson, who gave us Guns of Navarone and the original Cape Fear back in the 60s, and two entries of the Planet of the Apes in the 70s, and shortly after this would switch to more action-oriented films, and this is one of his only horror-themed movies in his entire catalog. And what's funny is that this is probably the fifth or sixth slasher that I've covered for the project so far, and this seems to be the first one to get sort of creative with the kills. I mean, some of the others have brought in some different weapons and such, but the scarf in the motorcycle and barbell kills are just upping the ante for the genre. Actor Glenn Ford was, I guess, embarrassed to be involved with the production, regretting taking a role in a slasher flick, and was combative on set, reportedly even hitting the AD on the film almost causing him to be arrested, and was rumored to be frequently drunk on set. And it's possible that this one is mostly known for the box art, with the shish kebab, and the movie does deliver on that promise. It's not like it was a bait and switch. That's in there. Another moment of note is the ending, which features a pretty out there twist to it, and the press releases all stated that they shot multiple endings in order to maintain secrecy. However, much later on, it was revealed that only one ending was shot, and that whole fabrication was made because during filming, there was no ending for the script. There was an original ending, but during production, they changed the script so much that that one no longer worked, so they kept going with no clear ending in mind until they finally got to it, which may be why the twist happens so out of the blue. It was pretty heavily promoted, and they were really hoping it would be the next big horror hit, but it wasn't as much of a smash as they had hoped, and in the end, it brought in just under 11 million, which certainly isn't a blockbuster, but the movie only cost around three and a half million, so it did make money, and had a certain amount of buzz around it, and has since become one of the more known slashers from the time period, even if it's not the most revered. My rating on it is a three and a half. I actually really, I really like it, but I, but I think it goes on for a bit too long. And the ending is a little out of left field. Its significance is a 3.5 as well, since it is pretty well known, but never really caught on as much as they would have hoped. And it didn't really build any sort of horror legacy. Should you watch it? Oh yeah, yeah, it's definitely a good time. Happy birthday to me. On that same date, May 15th, we got the release of The Fan, not to be confused with the 1996 Robert De Niro Wesley Snipes film of the same name. No, this one has Lauren Bacall as famous actress Sally Ross and Kyle Reese as an obsessed fan sending her creepy ass letters. It's Sally's 50th birthday, which is favorable considering Bacall was 56 or seven at the time, and she's worried about her age, but come on, she's still stunning. Her ex-husband is a maverick, and he's considering getting remarried. And Douglas works at a record store with China Beach in one of her earliest roles. Maureen Stapleton is here as well, and Sally is starting work on a musical. And Doug's messages start to get more extreme, talking about his uh, e equipment and such, and gets fired. And then gets rebuffed by Sally's secretary, and oh, hey, uh, Griffin Dunn. And, all of this sends him into a downward spiral, eventually attacking Belle with a razor, 
almost killing her. And this was actually the film debut of Ed Bianchi and his very first filming of any kind. And like your very first ever film has Lauren Bacall and James Garner and oh yeah, also Hector Elizondo in it, which he got from getting tons of acclaim for the work he did for commercials, winning major ad awards. After this though, he'd go back to commercials and music videos for over a decade, not really returning to major directing work until the early 2000s, but then working on a string of major shows like The Wire and Deadwood. And this was based on a novel of the same name and was actually in the works since 1979, with several directors reported to be attached. But due to constant delays, they all left. At one point, Elizabeth Taylor was meant to play the part of Sally, but also eventually moved on. And the original script was more of a straightforward thriller with less of the giallo-like gore going on. But after the success of Dress to Kill, the studio decided to up the violence, much to the surprise of Bacall, who stated that the finished product didn't look very similar to the version as she signed on for. When it was released, it was like, bad news all around. With, with a budget of around $10 million, it only managed to bring in $3 million at the box office, making it a distinct bomb which might be why Bianchi didn't direct again for so long, but that's not it. First up, critics smeared it, calling it overwhelmingly predictable. And even James Garner called it one of the worst films that he made, but it also got controversy because it reflected what was going on at the time. Fan stalkers were a major thing in this time frame, what with John Hinckley Jr. shooting at Ronald Reagan to impress Jodie Foster just two months before this film's release, and John Lennon shot and killed by Mark David Chapman just six months earlier. Even though the film was in development and shot well before these events, it was seen as trying to take advantage of these scenarios and scorned for it. Over time though, it's developed a bit of a cult following, with even Bacall later calling it some of her best acting. And it's earned some camp stripes too, most notably for its delightfully cheesy song, Hearts Not Diamonds, which was nominated for a Razzie. And my rating on it is a three. It's, it's kind of fun, like, like there's some good stuff happening, but it's not consistent, and I can't call it good enough to be good, but it's not quite bad enough to be that fun, campy good. Its HCS is right in the middle with a 2.5 since it is a bit more known but lacks a lot of horror impact and didn't really give us anything that new. But with the talent involved, it definitely earns some significance, even if it didn't quite get that staying power. Should you watch it? Uh, probably. It's not great, but, it, but it's worth a look-see. Keep your diamonds. Hold on tight to me. Next, on May 25th at the Cannes Film Festival, Possession premiered, although it would get a wider release in France two days later on the 27th. It wouldn't get a US release until two years later in 1983, though. It has Dr. Alan Grant <sighs> Alan. in his second appearance this year. We, we literally just saw him a few episodes ago in The Final Conflict, but here he's facing a divorce with multiple Oscar-nominated Isabella Gianni, and he works as a spy but is quitting and comes home to find Anna has just left. This causes him to have a bit of a breakdown, becoming totally unkempt, and it seems as if Anna's behavior is becoming strange as well, abandoning their son, and things get weird when Bob's teacher looks identical to Anna, and things get violent with her lover, and then with each other. And this one was from Polish director Andrzej Zulowski, and this was his only English language film. And his reputation was built around really plumbing the dark recesses of emotional trauma and pushing his actors to the limit with their characters. Both O'Neill and Ajani have since stated that playing these characters stuck with them and were very difficult to shake off once filming ended with Johnny saying that she could only make this sort of film when she was young due to the toll that it would take on her afterwards. And O'Neill stating that it was the most extreme film that he had ever made. Clearly it was inspired by Zulowski's real life divorce, which he wrote the screenplay in the middle of. And if it seems so far to just be a rather intense relationship drama, 
Well, th th there's soon weird slime creatures in the bath, and bottle stabbings, and this glorious creature created by the great Carlo Rambaldi. And when this premiered at Cannes, it was welcomed with a Johnny winning the Best Actress Award, but when it reached general release, that welcome was not as warm. Critics called it confusing and incoherent, with some calling it boring and others calling it a mess. But it did have its champions as well, so response was fairly mixed. And then when it was released, its performance was me 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 mediocre at best. When it was finally released in the US, it was only in a truncated form, cutting out more than 30 minutes of the runtime, making the narrative even less cohesive leading to it only bringing in one million bucks at the ticket booth. However, since then, the appreciation for the film has only grown, with more people getting turned on to its surreal intensity and gorgeous cinematography, and horror fans catching on to its instances of brutal violence and funky creature effects, including a standout moment that would make viewers of hentai proud. Uh, this one, I'm giving a four. It's uh, a lot, j just a lot to take in, and, and I imagine it'd be a bit slow for some viewers, but I found it uh, pretty compelling stuff, and the performances are just top-notch, particularly uh, Johnny's completely unhinged subway breakdown. Its significance is a touch lower at a three, since it didn't really make an impact on the film world or the horror world, but it did have top-notch talent behind it and some great practicals and has a certain cult following, but I can't give it any higher since it just never really caught on. Should you watch it? Yeah. I, again, some may just end up calling it pretentious, but I don't I don't think so, and it, it really should be watched. <laughs> On May 27th, we have a pretty curious one because everything about it just feels like it's from an earlier era, and it's the Monster Club. This one has one of the Draculas, and like like Sam Neill, we're getting a bunch of Carradine here in 81, uh, between the Howling in Episode 3, the Nesting in Episode 4, and now this here in Episode 5. Th this year is full of this guy. Here, he's a famous author, and he's attacked by vampiric Vincent Price. And how the hell is this this hero's first appearance on the project? Erasmus feels bad for biting him, so he invites him to a monster party. And here's where we find out that it's basically a sort of a musical, in a way, as, as we get the song Monsters Rule, okay? Monsters Rule, okay. Monsters Rule, okay. We see the monster chart with some information I did not know. Now, a vampire and a werewolf would produce a weird vamp. But a werewolf and a ghoul would produce a weird goo. But a vampire and a ghoul would produce a vam goo. A weird goo and a weird vamp would produce a shaddy. Now, a weird goo and a vam goo would produce a maddy. But a weird vamp and a vam goo would produce a ratty. Now, if a shaddy were to mate with a ratty or a maddy, the results would be a muck. You, you follow that? So it's not just a musical, it's an anthology, and there's a series of three shorts, each one focusing on a different class of monster, with a song in between each one. I'm just a soccer boy. No, no. I'm just the first one tells of the Shad Mock and their terrible whistle that has horrible effects. Uh, the second is about a young vampire who is pretty mercilessly bullied at school, and Doc Loomis is here too, and his mom is Mary Goodnight, and he has to help out against a group of inept vampire hunters. The third story is about a movie director scouting locations and encountering Patrick McGee, also making his second appearance this year after being in The Black Cat. And the town is full of ghouls, and we learn about hum ghouls, which are the offspring of ghouls and humans. And damn, for a film in the 80s, now a year and a half into them, this feels like a mid-70s flick. And it, it's a British film, directed by Roy Ward Baker, who had also done previous anthologies like The Vault of Horror, and this would become his final film, although he still worked in TV for several years afterwards. And all the stories were based on those by famous horror writer Ronald Chetwin Hayes, the character that John Carradine plays. Um, although the author was disappointed in the finished work, since he, he didn't like the alterations, 
made his works, and he hated the musical interludes. Apparently, plenty of others did as well, since the film didn't do that well with either critics or audiences, which Baker attributed to them sitting on the film for over a year before releasing it, which he claims made the pop songs in the film feel out of date. And my rating on this one is a three. Again, it's pretty fun, and there's some enjoyable bits, but it's a bit all over the place and never really feels like a cohesive whole. Its HCS is a 2.5 since it's a touch more obscure, but still features a collection of horror greats, including Carradine and Price, and is the only time in his entire career that Price would play a vampire. Should you watch it? Yeah, sure, it's a fun watch, it's a good time. Welcome to the Monster Club. This next one came out sometime in June, although the exact date is questioned, but it may have been the 12th, and it's Demonoid, a name that's probably familiar if you're looking for sketchy downloads, but instead you get a severed hand that just sort of walks away before being sacrificed to a one-handed demon. So yeah, we're off to a wild start. In the present day, Mark and Jennifer here are checking out the ruins of the temple from the beginning, and oh no, quicksand! It must be the 80s if quicksand is a threat. And they end up finding that hand from the beginning. And are we pretending that this doesn't look like Pazuzu? Because I'm not. And Jennifer is Samantha Egger, otherwise known as the Brood Mom. And that night, the hand is reborn and goes straight for her feet, like Quentin Handatino or something. After Mark grabs it, it crumbles to dust, and shortly after, he destroys the tomb and heads to Vegas, where Wayne Newton is playing, and son of a bitch, that guy is eternal. This is freaking 1981, and he's playing the Sands. This is freaking 1981, and he's playing the Sands. It's now 40 plus years later, and he's still there, still playing Vegas like four times a week. Dude's 80, I don't know if I'm in awe or freaked out. There's a small role here for Ted White a little while before he'd reach his most known part, although one he wears a mask in. Um, it becomes clear that Mark's hand is possessed, and then Stuart Whitman is here, and we literally just saw him in the Monster Club. And our director here is Alfredo Zacarias, who mostly did Spanish films, and this was one of his few English-speaking productions. And he not only directed this, but co-wrote it and produced it as well. And I just realized that this is now the second film in this year about a killer hand. But this one gets pretty wild as the hand jumps from person to person, and they're always trying to cut it off. And there's a couple different versions of this one. Like there's the original Mexican version, which contained more violence and nudity, and the US version, which had a shorter runtime, reducing the amount of violence and nudity. It wasn't really a hit and sort of developed a reputation for being a bad film, with Germany running it as part of a series called The Worst Films Ever Made. Over time though, it's developed a modest cult following and gained a bit more respect. And I love that Jennifer is in the backseat of this cop car during the chase. And I'm assuming that they have a dummy back there for this stunt jump because damn, so my rating here is a 2.5, like, like, like every 15 minutes or so, there would be something that I would love, but then it would slump back into blah land in the interim. Its significance is pretty low at two, since it started to get a bit more notoriety in recent times, but it's still a bit unknown and doesn't have many horror events to stand out. Should you watch it? Probably, I mean, it has its moments. All right, things are about to get a bit dirty up here because on June 3rd in Spain, we get the release of Sadomania, another entry by Jess Franco. I, I know we mentioned him earlier when we talked about Zombie Lake, but this is now his fourth film on the project. And considering that this is technically only the 14th episode, that means that he's in more than a quarter of the episodes so far. So two newlyweds are stopped on the road and arrested by Magda here, played by Ajita Wilson, who had a pretty wild career. 
She's a trans woman who appeared in a number of hardcore films in the 70s and then made the crossover to softcore films and weird exploitation films like this one. She's running a detention center for women who are all forced to work topless for some reason. And oh man, this is another instance of how much of this can I even show you really? Are there any shots here that I can use? Tara is played by Ursula Buckfellner, who Franco had just worked with on Devil Hunter. And they do a most dangerous game kind of situation where they hunt the prisoners. And this one was obviously pretty controversial at the time. Like, in fact, the UK version was cut down by 17 full minutes, leaving it with a runtime of just over an hour. And of the four Franco films that have now been featured here, this is definitely the one that goes the furthest, even if it stops short of ever going hardcore. There's on-screen piercings, uh, this nightmarish clockwork thing, animal stuff, just, just, it's just a lot. Uh, unfortunately, with all of that lot, it never really has a story. It is just a chain of over-the-top shock moments with no real emotion. So you're not bought in and it gets a little lost in Franco's filmography. My rating is a one. I, I just found it boring. It, it tried really hard to push the limits, but without any sort of connection to anything going on, it just feels like, like a clip show of edginess. Its significance is a little higher, but not much at a 1.5, mainly due to Franco's involvement and the wild notoriety it's achieved. Should you watch it? This is a safe skip. The queen was cruel to the poor girl, making her wash the walls and scrub the scullery stairs and kitchen. And <laughs> poor little thing. Our final film for this block came out on June 5th in its final exam, although it did have its premiere earlier in the year in February, but June is when it's got its wider release. It begins with a couple in a car getting attacked and killed by a random guy, and it's the ending of the school year at Lanier College. And there's a group of kids, including Radish here, played by Joel Rice, who left acting to get into producing and seems to be fairly successful. And weirdly, Pretty much every third movie he's produced has Christmas in the title. Also, apparently the character of Radish was partially the basis for Randy in Scream, although there's not a ton of similarities outside of their fascination with killers. Although Randy was obsessed in fictional ones, whereas Radish is into real life mass murderers. Lisa here is sleeping with her professor and he's cheating on his ancient wife. She must be almost 30 by now. Oh man. She's about to crumble to dust. And then a group of masked men in a black van show up with machine guns and kill a bunch of people and everyone is shocked and surprised. Like, well, why are they so shocked? Oh yeah, this is 1981 where this sort of thing didn't happen instead of it happening, you know, every other week. Well, it turns out to have just been a prank. Like, oh, we thought a bunch of our friends were dead. That That's hilarious, but but you know, it's the football team, so the coach sticks up for them and the police end up not doing anything, of course. And we're like like a half hour in now and the killer has just now shown up. And what a surprise, a young student thinks she sees him out the window, but then he's gone. Our director here is Jimmy Houston, who also wrote it, and he had a pretty short career, but also directed the comedy flick, My Best Friend is a Vampire. Beyond that, his biggest claim to fame is writing the Billy Crystal and Gregory Hines comedy, Running Scared, but his final credit in the industry was 1997. And this one was made for a relatively low budget, reportedly around 350,000, and most of the crew were Houston's friends. And in scenes where background extras were needed, they would take turns filling in there as well. It wasn't very warmly received, being called just another knockoff of Halloween and Friday the 13th formats, although it got a bit of praise for its focus on the young characters, but that didn't really matter all that much since it still managed to do quite well. Uh, in its release, it made 1.3 million at the box office, although it was a part of the video nasty wave, even if it never was prosecuted against. I, I feel like I should also point out that the killer doesn't do anything outside of the opening kill until almost the one hour point of the movie with a rather large portion of the story being that prank, some hazing rituals, and a healthy dose of homoeroticism. 
once the violence starts, it be becomes a bit more interesting, even if it never really reaches the level of fun that you're hoping for. My rating on it is a two and a half. I like that they went for more character depth, but perhaps they went a little too far with it. There needs to be a balance, and they almost forgot they were making a slasher film for a while. Its significance is just a two though, since it did get some recognition and has developed more of a cult following, but never really stood out, didn't innovate at all, and even the killer is pretty forgettable, with the exception of one classic bit where he catches an arrow fired at him, which was actually done live on set. Should you watch it? Probably, it's a decent slasher that's nothing new, but it does have a decent atmosphere going on. You make one more move toward that girl, I swear I'm gonna hang your head on my wall. <laughs> so there you have it, uh, a little bit further into 1981 here. We're a little more than halfway done. There'll be nine episodes of 1981 when all said and done. And my favorite in this block was pretty easily the burning. Uh, th this block was, was pretty fun. There was a lot of good stuff in there, but there was really not much that was great and then the burning was kind of the best out of out of the group it, it's not one of my favorite slashers of all time but it's definitely my favorite in this in this block let me know your favorite down below i want to hear which ones you liked and which ones you didn't like which ones you now want to see if you enjoyed the video hit that like hit the subscribe so you get notified when new videos come up and also check out my patreon page at patreon.com slash movie timelines appreciate that we can help keep this project going and it will keep going because we're only about halfway into 1981 we've got so many more years to go so many more years to go right here on the 80s project